Hi friends, good to be with you again. Today is the 1st of June, 2022. Happy Wednesday to you, hump day. We're halfway through the week and can you believe it? <laughs> Almost halfway through the year already. It's been a kind of a strange spring. Doesn't feel quite like June yet, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. We're going through the names of God and the purpose of our study is to know God more fully. And really, that's the encouragement of the revelation God has given us in his word, the holy scriptures. God has revealed himself to us in his word. And we recognize that this is a partial revelation, not a full revelation of God. But the more we understand about the partial revelation of God, and especially as it pertains to the names of God, the better we can understand God himself. And I don't know about you, but I sure feel that I'm learning a lot about God as we learn about his names. And God is purposefully, remember, and intentionally and deliberately revealing himself through his names as we work through the book of Genesis and then the subsequent passages in the New Testament that help us to more fully understand God. So we know God is one who is uh, in a loving relationship with us as he reveals himself as Elohim, as he reveals himself, Jehovah, we know he is uh, righteous in ju his judgment of, it, us, of us and sin and truth. And there seems to be some tension there between Elohim and Jehovah. Uh, some of that tension is alleviated as he reveals himself as El Shaddai, uh, God of power or God of um, might, the almighty God. God as El Elyon, God Most High. God as Adonai, the Lord. Uh, in two relationships, that of master and servant, and then husband and wife. And yesterday we looked at God, El Olam, uh, God who is the God of uh, also power, but God of seasons or everlasting God. I told you yesterday that we were going to take a look at two uh, Greek words recorded in the New Testament, uh, but relatedly have much to say about who God is as our everlasting God. Now, remember, uh, El Olam is not the God eternal, but the God of the ages or the age by age or age to age God. And in the Greek, which is, by the way, a much more precise language than English. Uh, English is not very precise, ask uh, any English teacher. And there, the reason for that is there are just too many exceptions and not a whole lot of rules. And they don't always seem to uh, work as we would expect them to, number one. Number two, we don't have that many words in English. Our vocabulary is limited. But in the Greek, for instance, the word for time has, there are at least three, maybe four even, if uh, we're going to use all of the, uh, our Greek words for time. There are four different words for time. Two of those words, and, and the reason for this is to be more precise. Uh, when we say time, we don't always mean the same thing. When I ask someone, what time is it? Uh, I'm just asking simply for what hour typically of the day that we're living in. Someone might ask that same question, what time is it, but not necessarily mean what time of the day is it, but what period are we in, or what epoch, or what age are we living, what time is it, 
or what time was it when this happened? Not five o'clock or six o'clock or eight o'clock or noon, no, but uh, in what age or period? Uh, was the time the Renaissance period? Was the time before Jesus or after Jesus? So again, English, not precise. Time means a lot of things. However, in the Greek, which is a more precise language, there are many words for time. Two we want to look at. First is chronos. Uh, this word chronos, uh, we get uh, chronology in English, chronology. Uh, that's the uh, root chronos. And chronos means uh, chronological time. Surprise! <laughs> And so when we read the word chronos in Greek, we're just, um, the author who uses that word is just talking about chronological time. So when uh, they say, and the time was right, um, this and chronos, the chronos was right. Well, it was just the period of time. Uh, maybe it was noon, so the time was right for lunch, chronology. There's another word that means time in the Greek, um, and that word is kairos, not chronos, but kairos. And kairos in Greek refers to an anointed time or a, a period of special importance. So oftentimes you'll hear Greek scholars talk about a kairos moment, not a chronos moment. A chronos moment is just a moment in time. There's no significance to it. It's just chronology. But a kairos moment, ah, when the author in the Greek uses the word kairos, this is something special. What they're saying is uh, there, there's something about this time that, um, and the implication is that God is overseeing. So with uh, El Olam, the God of seasons or the God of ages or by age, this is captured in the word uh, kairos. So uh, in the book of Esther, for instance, that's written in Hebrew, of course, but in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, that word that's used uh, for such a time as this is kairos, not chronos, not such a time chrono, uh, chronologically for this, no, but such a time kairos, an important moment in the, God's history. And so when we talk about God as El Olam, God is revealing himself as a God of particular times. So let's talk a little bit then about Jesus. Jesus also used Kronos and Kairos. Um, most of the time, uh, Jesus would use when he's referring to uh, uh, now is not yet my time. Most of the time, he's using the word uh, Kairos in that place. It's not God's appointed time. So, for instance, at the first miracle of Jesus captured in the Gospel of John, the wedding at Cana, uh, Jesus' mom, Mary, comes up to him and says they've run out of wine. And Mary and Jesus and uh, Jesus' family, they're friends of the bridegroom. And it's on the bridegroom's family to make sure that there's enough wine for the celebration. This would be a huge societal faux pas that the bridegroom's family would allow the wedding banquet to run out of wine. So Mary is concerned. She goes to Jesus, knowing he could do something about this, apparently, and says, Jesus, you have to do something. They've run out of wine. And Jesus says to Mary, it's not yet my time. God has not appointed the time for me to make myself known. But what did Jesus say there? He's referring to the continued outpouring of his ministry. This is early on in the ministry of Jesus. And so it was not yet his time. We might say it wasn't the, um, the ready time or the right time. So God, El Olam, 
reveals a God who is deliberate, who is an intent, uh, who is intentional, uh, who works with humanity seasonally. So remember, we talked about um, Elohim and uh, uh, Jehovah and El Shaddai and even uh, El Elyon as talking about God's characteristics. Uh, Adonai and now El Olam talking more about God's relationships. This is who God is or how God is, and this is how God relates to people. Uh, not a strict bifurcation here, but more um, loose. We, we hold this more loosely. So God is revealing himself relationally. He is a God of seasons. And we see Jesus talk about these seasons. We see God working through our lives in seasons and through the life of Israel as chosen people. And it reveals to us a God who is, though unchanging, the Bible says God is the same today as he was yesterday, as he will be tomorrow. Though God is unchanging, God's relationship with people is ever-changing. We refer to these changes oftentimes within Christendom as seasons. So El Olam helps us see a God that's revealed as one in relationship with humanity that takes us through seasons of life, through epics, through periods, through, through all of the ages. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together, uh, for our study in your understanding your names more fully. Uh, continue to lead and direct and guide us as we seek to be changed, transformed into your image. For your glory and honor, we pray it for the sake of others. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to be back, friends. Back in the office this week, uh, getting back into ministry and mission, and what a joy it is to be able to do that together with you. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.